I have a feeling that the thing that people are up against, and, and I thought a lot about this with food, at Quest, I wasn't thinking, oh, I need to make this convenient. That was part of it. And we yeah. certainly were not blind to the fact that giving somebody a package good that they could carry in their purse was going to be really helpful. Yeah. But the mantra I kept saying to myself was, I want to make food that people can choose based on taste. Yeah. And it happens to be good for them. Totally. Because I think people will go way out of their way, violate rules, all that, yeah. uh, to eat something that makes them feel the way they want to feel. And if I had to anchor all of my fears around people not being able to accomplish what they want to accomplish, it would all be around the things you're going to need to do don't feel the way you want them to feel. Hmm. And because they don't feel the way you want them to feel, you veer towards yeah. the things that do make you feel the, the way you want to feel. Now, part of that you can accomplish by reframing, but part of it, I think, is inescapable mm -hmm. you're going to do what feels good and you're going to avoid what's yeah. painful for the most part okay i love this so one of the one of the big misnomers in my opinion around discipline is that people who who like some people might look at me and say that oh alex is really disciplined but i actually really do what i want to do every day and it just so happens to be work that is productive and, and makes money but that statement that you made earlier that uh people shoot what do you said you said people do what makes them feel the way they want to feel right and then they, they you said well oh it's because it's not making them feel the way they want to feel and my only addition to that would have just been yet just yet and so it's usually because their extinction curve is too low right on the behavior and so if i go let's say i'm the best door knocker in the world best door knocking sales guys and i knock on five doors I might not get an answer from any of those five doors. And I walk away and I say, I guess door knocking isn't for me. And I might be the LeBron James of door knocking, right? But if the sample size is too small because my extinction curve just cuts off really fast, I'll never know. And so that's why it's like, if, if you can give the thing the opportunity to reinforce its own behavior, then it goes from external to internal. Right? like video editors, for example, like there's people who love, I mean, you, we're going to film school, right? Um, in the beginning, you suck at editing film, but then you like make the letters appear and you get instant feedback and you're like, whoa, that was rewarding, right? And then you do it again and then you learn another technique and another technique, another technique. And so then the behavior itself becomes rewarding and you begin to like work, right? You begin liking your work. And so I think it really is that just getting over the hump in the beginning of knocking on a thousand doors rather than five and realizing that it would make sense that you would suck because you haven't done it before. Um, but knowing that if other people have done it too, that there is a reward that will eventually come and it will reinforce me just like it has every other human before me who has done this. And I think just like one of my my core, you know, assumptions, um, as I like to say, um, is that if, if somebody else can do these behaviors, I can do these behaviors and get the same outcome. You know, barring external environments or timing and things like that. But, you know, assuming that those are the same, like door knocking to sell solar today is the same as it was last year. And if I see somebody who's number one in solar and I do the same behaviors as them, I will likely get an outcome that is decent. And so I that that's what gives me uh, confidence going into a new environment is modeling somebody and just being like, ignore all of these other things. What are the behaviors? How many times is, you know, is this person, you know, how, how quickly do they walk from door to door? Do they only go to apartment buildings? Are they, you know, like what's their, what is all the steps that they do operationalizing success um, rather than kind of like the, the theorizing that I feel like happens a lot. And I think that's, to be fair, I think the reason a lot of people kind of like some of the content that I put out from a money-making perspective is how can I operationalize this word, right? So like patience, for example, is one that people throw out a lot. But for me, defining patience was helpful, which is figuring out what to do in the meantime. Like that's patience. Like we're like, I'm not patient. It's like, no, you just need to figure out what to do in the meantime. That's all. Like you and I are being patient on all the investments that we made last year while we're having this podcast. Like they are happening. We're figuring out what to do in the meantime. So we're being patient. And so it's like patience feels bad when you're focusing on it. But if you're not focusing on it, then patience happens by default. Um, like sadness, for example, like that was really helped me to find, uh, figure out just even defining the word in terms of operational perspective, help me get out of those funks faster, which is, um, Sadness comes from a lack of options, a perceived lack of options, which is why it feels like hopelessness. But if it comes from a perceived lack of options, then it means that you solve that with knowledge because it's perceived lack of options, which is an ignorance problem, which means it's solvable, which all of a sudden gives me something to do. So then all of a sudden I do have an option and then you can get out of the funk. And like anxiety is the, is the reverse of that, which is I have many options and I don't know which one to pick, which means I don't have priorities. So like you solve sadness through knowledge, you solve anxiety 
through decisions. And so like helping me just spell those out to myself, I'm like, ah, I feel anxious. Okay, that means that I have lots of paths and I need to make a decision. So which one am I going to decide so I can get out of this bad feeling? If I have sadness, great, what do I not know? Okay, now I have to go figure that out. Great, I have something to do. And so that like it, you can, I think these are like mental models around using emotions to fuel the behaviors that you want. I didn't want to say a word during that because I think <laughs> um, what you're talking about is, so I'm, as, as you're talking, I'm trying to map um, my fear about people not being able to make the change. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the more I think about it, the more I think this boils down to people feel a way that they don't want to feel and they don't know how to handle that. Yeah. And you just, without me even thinking to ask you, um, you were going through how to deal with different emotions and by having a plan, by having a procedure, which I think you're going to call operationalizing. Yeah. Um, then you know what to do. Oh, when I encounter sadness, then I do this. When I encounter mm -hmm. anxiety, then I do this. And so it's a very action oriented plan. Yeah. Um, so I want to plant a flag in that, and then I want to follow up with how one goes about um, operationalizing something. Okay, so I'm going to lay out a thesis. You can yeah. push back or whatever. Uh, people, one of the the things that you and I have both said historically that I think is maybe the most powerful thing we will ever say, and everything after that is just what you do once you get over that. Uh, your life is an exact reflection of your choices. You are not a victim. And even if you are, it does not help you to think that way. You mm -hmm. have to break through that. And um, one of the intros to this episode that I considered was that um, every day, each of us has to make a choice whether we are going to play the victim or play the game. Okay. And if you're going to play the game, play to win. It's mm -hmm. the only thing that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But that is um, negative emotions can be so gnarly mm -hmm. that we need to make it somebody else's fault that to mm -hmm. point all 10 fingers back at us. And this mm -hmm. is one of the things to get hired at impact theory. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be asked a question along the lines of something horrible happens to you. How many fingers go outwards and how many fingers point back at you? And the punchline is if all 10 are not coming right back at you, yeah. it's just disempowering. It doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. Sure. Nothing you can do about a tornado, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But still to realize that you can make different choices and get a different outcome. Uh, but people don't do that mm -hmm. a lot because to do that, if you don't have the right frame of reference, mm -hmm. if you haven't leaned on the right traits, yeah. if you aren't building your self-esteem around the right thing mm -hmm. in that moment to say that it's your fault, fault, fault mm -hmm. is just emotionally devastating. And people have not operationalized their encounter with negative emotions. And therefore they will do anything they have to do completely unconsciously mm -hmm. to not feel that way. Mm -hmm. Now, if that is, uh, doing drugs, they'll do drugs. If that's drinking, masturbation, cheating, whatever, yeah, yeah. they will do all of it. But it really boils down to what's your relationship with your emotion. Mm -hmm. Now to push this farther and to really um, make clear what I think, I don't think emotions are objectively real. I don't think that people ought to believe an emotion. Mm -hmm. I think people think because they feel it, it is the right reaction to objective truth rather than a subjective reaction to perception. Sure. And if you can understand that all of your emotions are a subjective reaction to perception, totally. that mm -hmm. you can take control of that, that you can reframe things, you can have a different emotion. And now in that moment, instead of doing something that moves you away from your goals, yeah. you can replace it with something that moves you towards your goals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's my thesis as, as I really think about boiling it down to what messes people up. It's that if I'm right about that, how do you operationalize anything? Like, what does mm -hmm. that mean? Because I have a feeling yeah. the thing that makes you phenomenal is the ability to operationalize everything. So if I, I love this the conversation, just a side note. Um, so in my opinion, a, a lot of things, even huge departments, practices in business and medicine and everything come down to learning and communication. And so let's define terms. So learning is same condition, new behavior. So to the point, I felt sad last time I learned this new thing from this podcast on impact theory, which is okay, if I feel sad, then it means that I don't see an option, which means I need to get more uh, education or knowledge on the subject so that I can figure out what to do. Well, at least 
deciding that I need to learn more gives me the next step that I need to do. And boom, I'm not sad. And so you've been sad before and then it took you five days to get out of it and you're sad now and it takes you five minutes to get out of it. Same condition, new behavior. So you learned. And so if we go one degree move from that, and I'm going to circle back to the original point. If we think about intelligence, right? Um, like what is intelligence? As I define it from an operational perspective, it's rate of learning, right? So somebody who learns really slowly is less intelligent. Someone who learns really quickly is more intelligent. But that means that intelligence is just a rate. It's a measurement of how quickly you change your behavior in the same condition. And so if you continue to listen to podcasts and you wake up in the same exact conditions every day and your behavior does not change, it means you learned nothing, which means you are not as smart as you think you are. But it also means that you can influence and have a direct influence on your intelligence by increasing or decreasing the time it takes you to actually act on the knowledge you have when the same condition presents itself. And so for me, that's incredibly empowering because it's like I can be smarter by simply hearing what this person says, getting the same condition and then immediately changing my behavior. Wow, that's cool. And so that then like from the fingers perspective, it's like, OK, all 10 fingers are on me of how I can influence my own surroundings and, and do the things that I want to do. Um, so to, to circle back to um, <laughs> the original question, I think, which I probably dovetailed a little bit, um, was, can you repeat it one more time? How <laughs> do you operationalize things? What does that mean? So, okay. So it's breaking down, what does this word mean from a behavior perspective? So it's, 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 it's really hard. Like, I think the reason that so many people are confused and they have a hard time remembering things and understanding complex topics is because they have lots of words in their heads that they have not defined. I really mean, like, I, I truly believe that, which is why every book that I have begins with a definition of terms, which is like, this is what an offer is. This is what a lead is, right? These are, these are what this means, right? Um, and until you have that, you're just, you're basically making face noise, right? Like if I say leads and you perceive that as something different, then we can't actually have a conversation because we're not talking about the same thing. And so a lot of people have a lot of words they've heard other people say that they not along to. And some people are like, makes sense. And they say, yes. But when someone says, does that make sense? We have been trained as humans to nod and say, yes, it doesn't mean it makes sense. It means that when we have that cue, that's the behavior we do, right? Because we know that we get punished when we say no, because then it becomes all oh, this big thing. And then, you know, you dovetail into all these other conversations and you get punished for it. Right. And so you learn what's reinforced. And most people say, makes sense. And then you say, which means nod your head when I say this. And you're like, I nod my head. Great. And then you move on. And so I think that's why a lot of people don't learn because they actually don't know what the words mean. And so um, to operationalize something, it is simply going back down to when I say I'm confident, what does that mean? It's not a feeling. It's not a, what other people say about you. Like none of that is measurable. Like how much, like what is measurable? It's a percentage of likelihood that what I say will happen, will happen. Period. That's what it is. Now, what you'll also find is that there are a lot of words that mean the same thing. And that doesn't mean that the, the concept wrong. It's just the fact that English or whatever language you learn usually has a melting pot of like, well, this is the version of the Nordic word. And this is the version of the Hindi word. And this is the version of the French word. And they're all in the lexicon, but most of them more or less mean the same thing. And so getting away from words, meaning what the, di the dictionary tells us it means and just say, what does it mean to me in terms of what I can do with it? Then I think makes navigating life a lot simpler because the only thing we can control is our behavior. And so that if we define the words in terms of what we do about it, then these all become things that we can control and, and can change our lives with. Yeah. Okay. That I think is super important. Um, one of the things that, that changed my life and the easiest way to explain it is how it manifested in my marriage was to define terms. Mm. And because what Lisa and I were realizing is we're saying the same words, but we don't mean the same thing. Totally. And that's creating a lot of confusion. Now, as a leader in a business, this becomes problematic often because you will say something that to you yeah. is self-evident exactly what it means. People do the, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, nod. Yeah. And um, they do that a lot. And so Lisa and I started defining really simple words. Like what do, when you say you promise, what yeah. does that mean? When yeah. you say something's important, what does that mean? Yeah. And so like in our marriage, if we use the word important, it means stop whatever you're doing. I don't care if you're with the president of the United States, you will immediately get up, leave that and deal with this thing because it's important. Yeah. So if it is meaningful, but not important, then fair enough. It's meaningful, but I'm in the middle of something. I'll get cool. to it later. Doesn't mean that it's, you know, not mm -hmm. something that needs to be addressed, but it isn't important. Cool. Now we have a shared lexicon. Yeah. Um, and I think that 
going back to my thesis around emotions, mm -hmm. emotions are the subconscious's way of communicating to the conscious mind. So when you think about, and this isn't, I mean, this is me making things up. This is me yeah. connecting dots that behavioral science has made abundantly clear, but I am admittedly connecting dots. But uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett wrote a whole book on this called How Emotions Are Made. So this is not me just shooting from the hip, but I'm, I'm putting my own words to it. Um, the, the way that you feel is the subconscious mind, which can process information uh, faster and vaster, as they say. So it's yeah. a, a much larger number yeah. of data points process much quicker, but when you bring it into the conscious mind, you're gonna think either in images or in words. Most people probably think primarily in words. And so it really narrows down your ability to um, deal with a lot of information. And because emotions um, are coming from the limbic brain, which we had before we had the higher level cognition that humans have that other animals don't have, you're gonna be in a situation where, oh, snake, and you just jump. You just have the emotion and you move. Yeah. Um, most people leave things there. And so they're never pulling that into the light to say, ooh, why do I feel so uncomfortable in this moment? What, what is it? And if they would take the time to define mm -hmm. what the discomfort is, then they might be able to operationalize yeah. the response that they should have to this predicated on, at mm -hmm. least from my perspective, what's your goal? Mm -hmm. So I feel some kind of way, but I have a goal. My goal makes demands, which is something I don't think people think about very often. To achieve your goal, just, hey, there's physics to it. So certain things will move you towards your goal and certain things won't. So my goal makes demands, but I feel some kind of way that make me want to move in the opposite direction of the demands that my goals make. So now, using your words, I have to operationalize my encounter with this emotion, define it, define a response, and then actually adhere to that response in order to move towards my goals. And that the, the moment where you pull the emotion into the spotlight of your conscious attention and define it in a really simple way, I think is where the vast majority of humanity get lost. Mm -hmm. So um, I do something called Impact Theory University and I answer some of the same questions over mm -hmm. and over and over. And they often have to do with that moment. Somebody does not understand their own emotions and therefore mm -hmm. they cannot operationalize the next move. I have so much to say, I will keep it short. Say it so, so I wanna, so in reference back to what I was talking about, like with sadness and anxiety and patience, like these are all, well, patience is more of a behavior. Sadness is a feeling that, and then how do we translate that, right? Um, I want to be clear that I use those terms because I want to meet people where they're at. Me personally. And if you look at it from like the, the behavioral science perspective, you have stimulus and you have response. What happens in the box of like what this person feels, right? Like if I hold up a red flashcard to a random person and then I slap them and then I hold the red flashcard again, like all of a sudden, some of them might feel anger. Some of them might feel fear. Like what they feel when they see the stimulus, which I've now paired with a response, right, is going to be different. And so I think a lot of effort goes into people and even people in our world trying to help people describe their feelings, talk through things, blah, blah, blah. And I, I just genuinely think that it's a waste of time because not who cares, but why does it matter? Because you can do it when you're sad, you can do it when you're angry, you can do it when you're fearful. And again, to the point is if 100 people more find out about the thing that I'm trying to sell or whatever I'm trying to do, then I'll have a greater percentage likelihood that I will get this outcome. That's it. And I think a lot of people, they just get into this cycle of trying to analyze their feelings. And then they're like, oh, it's because I had this trauma when I was a kid. And, you know, because my dad didn't hug me enough and like, blah, blah, blah. It's like the because for most people's explanation is irrelevant. Because I get like, I had a, a podcast question the other day that asked, um, do you feel like uh, uh, trauma, you know, is, is something that creates success later in life among entrepreneurs, blah, blah, blah. And um, I really thought about it. And I was like, I think people suffer and some people become successful. So do I think that suffering creates success? No, I think that everyone suffers and some of them become successful and then they attribute their success to make it feel worth it to have gone through that suffering because they have an outcome. But I don't think that they're related in any way because like you were successful because you did the thing. How you thought about it is completely irrelevant. And I just think that there's so much effort 
that gets put into that conversation, um, which is why I have really contrarian views around like therapy and things like that. But um, I think like if you keep opening a wound, like what does it help you? I don't know, like you still didn't make the calls. So like, let's, let's, let's create an environment where it's more likely that you create, that you do the calls that you need to make. And it just, it, it simplifies the variables that we can control because no one knows, like even, even adding the because to things like I did this because it's like, you don't even know why you're doing what you're doing. And so when people are like, Tom, what's your number one reason for success? We're making it up. We're making up our, our response. I mean, it's what it is. We're like, how do I, there's a, a hundred things, a zillion things. I don't know. Like, is it because my dad didn't hug me enough? Is it because my mom, like, who knows? Maybe if he would have been president, still it would have been fine. Like, it could be completely irrelevant, but we just choose to give this thing that some percentage of the audience then says, oh, that's like me. And maybe th then I can be successful too. And that's fine. But I think the, the, the boiling it down to the absolute basics or not even basics, the absolute truths of it are that there's a stimulus and there's a response. What happens in the box inside of your head does not matter. If you respond a certain way, you have learned. And if you continue to see the same stimulus and you don't respond the way you want to, you have not learned. So you need to learn. I love how direct and simple that is. 